And now it's time for the Hindu Prize 2015. My colleague Lata Ganapati will take you to the award ceremony. A warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the much-awaited segment of Lit for Life, the Hindu Prize 2015. The Hindu has always been committed to promoting good literature, both in English and Indian languages. In 2010, the idea of a prize that would commemorate the best of Indian writing in English was mooted and the Hindu Literary Prize was instituted to honor writers who have spent their lifetime mining the human spirit through their words and ideas. Now renamed the Hindu Prize for Fiction, this award stands proud and equal to the many other coveted literary awards of the world. The shortlist for the Hindu Prize 2015 are Odysseus Abroad by Amit Chaudhary, Flood of Fire by Amitav Ghosh, Sleeping on Jupiter by Anuradha Roy, When the River Sleeps by Eastreen Kire, Seahorse by Janus Pariyat, and Patna Manual of Style by Siddharth Chaudhary. We begin the segment with readings from some of the shortlisted books. I invite Eastreen Kire, Janice Pariyat, and Siddharth Chaudhary to the stage. Eastreen Kire's first book of poetry, Kelho Kavira, was the first book of English poetry in Nagaland. Her novel, A Naga Village Remembered, published in 2003, was the first by a Naga writer in English. Her book, Bitter Wormwood, was shortlisted for the Hindu Prize 2011. Apart from novels, she has also written five children's books, several articles, and essays. Please welcome Eastreen Kire. Hello, Chennai. It's such an honor to be here in this city, which after that terrible uh, period of flood and devastation, has shown the rest of the world what people can do when they come together and rebuild the city <laughs> with love and compassion. I'm just so happy to be here. Before I read, I'll just quote a little from, my, from the back of the book. It's about a lone hunter, Villiers, who sets out to find the river of his dreams, to rest from its sleeping waters, a stone that will give him untold power. It is a dangerous quest, for not only must he overcome unquiet spirits, vengeful sorceresses and demons of the forest, there are men armed with guns on his trail. Kire's novel transports the reader to the remote mountains of Nagaland, a place alive with natural wonder and supernatural enchantment. As Velia treks through the forest, we are also swept along in this powerful narrative and walk with him in a world where the spirits are every bit as real as men and women and where danger or salvation lies at every turn. This is a book about, which is an exploration of the Naga spiritual universe. I'll read from chapter 25. The heading is, The River is a Spirit. Vilya was flung back like a bit of driftwood by the inrushing waters. His mouth and nostrils filled up with water as he felt himself being sucked down by the treacherous undercurrent. The river was almost human as it pushed him down and under, down and under, and the water rushed at him as though it would strangle him. He was shocked at the violence of the river. I'm going to get out of this alive, he swore as he fought back. At first, he flailed his arms helplessly as he had in his nightmare dreams of the river. But this was terrifyingly real. He would not wake up and cry with relief that it was only a dream. This was as real as real could be. Then he stopped struggling and concentrated instead on the spirit words he had learned. 
Sky is my father, earth is my mother. Stand aside, death. Kepenyopfe fights for me. Today is my day. I claim, claim the wealth of the river because mine is the greatest spirit. To him who has the greatest spirit belongs the stone. How long he kept fighting the river, Vilya did not know, but it seemed like an eternity before he was released. And the waters retreated and he could step out of it unharmed, clutching the hard stone. Kani was standing anxiously by the edge and pulled him out swiftly as he emerged from the river. Come on, we have to run back before the widow women come after us. It was the first time Kani had spoken all afternoon and the urgency in his voice was very real. Vilia heard a shriek and looked upward at its source and saw black figures descending towards them. The widow women were running down the hill, waving thin spears and shouting curses on the two men. Run, cried Kani, but Vilya needed no urging. He clambered after Kani, disregarding the small stones that cut his feet and the thorns that made them bleed. He ran for his life as the widow women chased them wildly. While they were still on the far bank, the men got out of the river area. The water had completely receded and they fled for their lives. Even as they sped on, they could hear sounds of hissing and grunting behind them. Neither dared to look back. They ran as swiftly as they could, Vilya clutching the stone to him and Kani with his twisted arm in front of him, leaping goat-like over the high rocks in his way. They heard different sounds behind them. First, it was the cackling of old, old women, the sound of malicious victory. That was followed by laughter, the gurgling laughter of babies and children, innocent and enticing, urging them to look back. As the men carried on running, the laughter turned to high-pitched shrieks as the widow women's spirits tried to threaten and frighten the two men. When they reached the outer path, which marked the boundary between the sleeping river and the border village. Kani shouted at the widow women, Back! Back now! Or the worse for you! The shrieks stopped instantly and they withdrew. But they wailed as they went, the gaulish wailing filling the air and polluting it. Kepenyovazanu chiyallam hadale! shouted Kani. And the evil sound stopped abruptly. The widow women's spirits sank down to the ground defeated. The two men did not stop to see if they resumed their original shapes or not. They headed for the village, not exchanging a word, but each thinking to himself the thoughts that strengthened his spirit. Thank you. Siddharth Chaudhary is the author of Diksha at St. Martin's, Patna Rafgat, day scholar and the Patna Manual of Style. In 2013, day scholar was one of the novels featured in 50 writers, 50 books, the best of Indian fiction. In 2015, Chaudhary received the British Council's Professional Excellence Award. Let's welcome Siddharth Chaudhary. Uh, I'll read from the first section of the volume. It's called The Importer of Blondes. I had got the job at Touch Magazine through Ritwik Ray, a short story writer I admired in Patna. After I had called him very early one morning, when the phone reads were cheaper, drunk, despondent and broke a couple of weeks back, he asked me to meet Dam Sahab, who in his youth had published a left-wing poetry journal from Patna, and whom Ritwik knew from his Patna Sine Society days. For many of us young writers in Patna and Delhi in the 1990s, Ritwik Ray was someone we all looked up to. His novellas and slim anthology of stories, like The Prince of Patna, The Crown Jewels, Harry Da and other stories, Mao for the Misbegotten, were passed from one literary acolyte to another like talismans. It was the Masonic handshake that guaranteed lifelong friendships. From his stories, we learned about socialism and how to use it while writing political fiction 
decide of polemic. He was our own private Kotahar, our Trumbo, our Zahir Z. Abdali, our Kashinath Singh. His was the shining path we wished to traverse. We copied his look, noticed his style, or the lack of it, the full Hemingway beard with its flecks of premature grey, the thick reversible Khadi Gramudyog Bhavan Bandi over the regulation white shirt and denims in winter, the police surplus store khaki satchel and the gleaming black Yezdi, his pride and joy, on the back seat of which sat the latest prototype of Mira Verma, his great lost love, dusky in cottage emporium saris, coal-lined eyes, concealed by Ray-Ban wayfarers, troubled and aloof. I had borrowed the Yezdi when my own great love, Charulata Roy, had come to Patna from Dhanbad to take her national eligibility test for lecturership last year. And we had driven out to the Gandhi Setu Bridge, which connected Patna to North Bihar, and watched the barges sail majestically towards Benares on the preternaturally calm Ganges in the twilight. Fiction for Ritwik was only a tool for class struggle. It was to be used forever against the rich, the middle classes, and in the defense of the poor, the marginalized. Even though I agreed entirely with him, I neither had his strength of conviction nor his streak of uncompromising austerity. I was forever in doubt, and moreover, poverty didn't agree with me. Take the job if he offers you one, even though I must warn you that the magazine he publishes is just about rubbish. Work on your novel. That is the most important thing. Besides, money is always welcome. Just hang in there till I set you up with something in publishing soon. Ritwik's voice, as calm and warm-hearted as ever, even though it was just before five and he had a quarter bottle of old monk, a night habit. An aristocrat by birth and a Marxist by conviction, Ritwik knew the terrible despondency that could afflict a writer of fiction, having experienced it many times himself, and that a little compassion went a long way. In a day or two, everything would be fine. God bless him. Thank you so much. Thank you, Siddharth Chaudhary. Janice Pariyat is the author of Boats on Land, a collection of short stories, and Seahorse, a novel. She was awarded the Sahitya Academy Yuva Puraskar and the Crosswood Prize for Fiction. Let's welcome Janice. Good afternoon. As Estherine mentioned, it's an absolute joy to be here. So um, thank you for coming along. Um, I'll be reading two shortish excerpts from Seahorse, but just to give you um, a little bit of context, um, Seahorse is a retelling of a Greek myth, um, the myth of Poseidon, the god of the sea, and his relationship with a younger man um, named Pelops. Um, in the book, this transforms into a relationship between Nicholas, an art historian, and his young student, Nehemiah, or Nem. Um, and the book begins with an absence. And so I begin with Nicholas's disappearance, the moment I discovered he was missing. I remember like it was yesterday, although perhaps that isn't an accurate way to phrase it. Yesterday may be further away than two years past, than seven or ten. I can't recall my supper a week ago, but that morning remains palpable in my memory like the touch of sudden heat or tremendous cold. It's a wine I've sipped and sipped so long, it colors everything on my palate. It was July, but early enough in the day for the air to still be mild, sunshine glimmering white around the edges, warning of the heat to come. I'd arrived at the New Delhi railway station at dawn, even at that time clamorously crowded with bustling coolies and families recumbent on the platforms. I hurried back to my room in the north of the city in a taxi, the roads clear and quiet through old Daryaganj, along the wide length of Rajkat, 
the pale fu fury of the red fort. Everything, I felt, was touched by unimaginable beauty. After only a quick shower to wash away the grime of a two-day train journey, I headed to the bungalow on Rajpur Road. I was in a hurry. I took the shortcut through the forest. When I reached, the security guard wasn't at the gate. The wicker chairs on the and the table on the lawn, nowhere in sight. I remember, as I walked up the porch, dusty and littered with leaves, how it crept into my heart, a rush of something like love. When I tried the door, it opened easily. The bungalow lay still and silent, everything in its place. The dining table set as though for ghosts, with plates and cutlery, the drawing room tidy with cushions, an arrangement of flowers. I headed straight for the bedroom, expecting to find Nicholas sleeping, tangled in a sheet, dream heavy. Above him, the patient creak of the fan, swirling, the smell of him in the air, sweet and salty, the tang of sweat. He wasn't there. The bed was made in neat, geometric precision, his things missing from the bedside table. I walked down the corridor to the study. In all my months in the bungalow, I hadn't ever seen it so uncluttered. I looked for a painting, the one that had stood on the table of a woman holding a mirror. It was gone. Only when I reached the veranda did something splinter, and it rushed in the fear that had been waiting in the wings. In the corner, his aquarium, that bright and complete universe, was empty. Nicholas disappeared in the summer of 1999, when I was 20, and in my second year at university. At first, I searched wildly for a note, some sort of written explanation, taped to mirrors or doors or walls, weighed down by books or bric-a-brac so it wouldn't be blown away. And then I sat in the veranda and waited. For what? I'm not entirely sure. Later around midday, when the silence grew deep and thick around me, I left. This time, I took the long way round, back to my room in a student resident hall in Delhi University, along the main road, willing the noise and traffic to somehow jolt me back to life. That this, as cliched as it may sound, had all been a dream. At first, it felt similar to the time I heard about my friend Lenny. Many months ago, my sister's voice, faint and grasping on the phone, I'm sorry, there were some complications. Yet this was not death. For death leaves behind modest belongings, the accumulated possessions of people's lives, their books and jewelry, a hairbrush, an umbrella. Lenny had been my friend, I had his letters, his VHS tapes, his cassettes, and folded away in the recesses of my cupboard, his faded leather jacket. With Nicholas, it was as though he had never existed. No life can be traceless and leave behind scarcely any imprints. Yet his hadn't. A great rushing tide had swallowed the shore and wiped it clean. That day passed as all others do. In my room, I worked through my unpacking slowly, filled not with anger or despair, but faint, lingering anticipation. Something else had to happen. This couldn't be all. This wasn't the end. I'd receive a letter. Nicholas would return. Someone would come knocking at my door, saying there was a phone call, a message, an explanation. That night, I went to bed in hope, and even now, I sometimes awaken with it wrapped around my heart. We are shaped by absence, the places that escape our travels, the things we choose not to do, the people we've lost. They are spaces in the trellis on which we trail from season to season. Nicholas and Lenny, though worlds apart, are inextricably linked on either side of a diptych, bearing the names of the living 
and the dead. Um, and a very, very short um, piece from later in the book. The book is also about the power of incompleteness and how the things that don't happen hold a strange um, power over us. If you visit the Galleria dell'Accademia in Florence and walk into the hallway where David is displayed, it's difficult to look at anything else. When you enter, he's to the right and you are suitably entranced. They've positioned him beneath a glorious dome and he's bathed in natural light. He is an angel. You circle him slowly, gazing up, casting your eyes over his limbs, studying the shape of perfection carved out of a 19-foot block of marble. Your thoughts are sparse, limited by awe. Somehow words and emotions seem inappropriate, out of place. Yet if you enter and turn left, you encounter something else entirely. Michelangelo's prisoners. Placed in a dark corridor, rows of figures commissioned for the never completed tomb of Pope Julius II. They are unfinished, perpetually wrestling with stone. Unlike most sculptors who built a model and then marked up their block of marble to know exactly where to chip, Michelangelo always sculpted freehand, starting from the front and working his way back. So these figures emerge from stone as though surfacing from a pool of water. They will not stun your mind into silence, rather they rouse it. You are moved by their frailty, their endurance. They are endless metaphor, an infinite possibility. Much the same as anything unfinished in our own existence. We treasure the incomplete for it lends us many lives, the one we lead and the million others we could have led. We are creatures of inconsistency, passionately partial, unexecuted, unperformed, undone, unaccomplished and unconcluded. David will only be David. Thank you. Thank you, Janice Pariot. I now request our shortlisted authors to take their seats in the auditorium. The other three shortlisted authors were unable to make it to the event today. Amit Chaudhary is a writer and musician. He's the winner of several awards, including the Commonwealth Literature Prize, the Los Angeles Times Books Prize, and the Sahitya Academy Award. Amitav Ghosh is the author of highly acclaimed works of fiction and non-fiction, which include the Booker Prize shortlisted Sea of Poppies, among others. He has won numerous prizes, including the Sahitya Academy Award, the Pushcart Prize, and the Grinzane Kavur Prize. Anuradha Roy is the author of Sleeping on Jupiter, which was long listed for the Man Booker Prize 2015, and has been shortlisted for the DSE Prize 2016. She won the Economist Crossword Prize for Fiction for the Folded Earth. I now request our chief guest for the award ceremony, Alexander McCall Smith, and our judges, Antara Dev Sen, K. Sachidanandan, Pradeep Sebastian, and Susie Taru, to take their seats on stage. Susie Tharu will now tell us about the judging process for the Hindu Prize 2015. Well, I have this uh, difficult task of telling you in three minutes uh, about the work we did over about six months when we were reading these books, uh, one time round, another time round, and so on. There are about 60 books this year, quite a catch. And the five of us, uh, Ashia Sattar is not here with us, five of us, uh, between us read all the books. And in fact, each of us would have probably read over 40 books. So it was quite a, a, a haul uh, and an exciting one too. 
uh, sometime in about November, you might have wondered how we were communicating. It was a delicate kind of affair. Uh, sometimes we felt the other person was telling us too much. We wanted to make up our own minds. Sometimes we were reaching out to others, asking questions. What did they think? Uh, how did they, did they like this book? Did they like, so it was a very pleasant, congenial kind of conversation that was taking place. And let me tell you, really, any one of these writers and some more could have won the prize, all right? Literary prizes are very chancy affairs. It depends who's on the jury. It depends on a moment. It depends on so many things. So we should, that's the spirit in which we should be taking it. Uh, this morning, we got together for the first time. Some of us were meeting each other for the first time. And we had a wonderful conversation. I'm sure you're all envious about us, about each of these books. We explored them in great detail. We listened to each other, and we slowly came to a conclusion. It was a, a very tight run. I think all six were books that demanded our attention in one way or the other. And the interesting thing was that none of us were passionately invested in any one book. So it made the conversation more open and the possibility of changing our minds and coming around to another point of view more possible. It was more possible. So that's where we were and how it all took place. I look back and I think, how did I read 60 books in two months? But I did and so did everyone else and I have thoroughly enjoyed the process. Thank you very much to all the authors and especially the ones who read so eloquently from their works uh, right now for a very pleasurable 2015 for me. Thank you, Ms. Susie Taru. K. Sachidanandan will now speak about the shortlisted books for the Hindu Prize 2015. Uh, dear friends, uh, Susie has already told you about the, the process that finally led to the shortlist. Well, we were looking, as anybody would be looking um, for uh, in, in the fiction that they read, uh, for uh, the freshness of the content, an individual style which made the work of fiction distinct, uh, and the uh, total innovativeness of the work uh, that in some way contributed to the genre itself and, and in, in some way challenged the existing conventions of the genre and uh, suggested ways of transforming it. And we arrived, I, I would also like to say that in fact this shortlist is, shortlists are always definitive while the price is always arbitrary. Uh, and and uh, uh, so here, here you have already the shortlist before you. Uh, so we arrived at uh, these uh, six books um, after a lot of discussion, exchanges of opinion, um, back and forth, arguments, polemics. Uh, one was, uh, Amidav, uh, of course this is in purely in the alphabetical order, uh, Amidav Khosh, Flood of Fire, uh, because, because we found it was, a, it was an over of epic proportions, of, um, um, and it had a profound pathos at the center of it, and it's, it, it's a scale, it's, a, it's very proportionate, it's epic, it's epic range. These fascinated us, and also the kind of intellectual rigor that he brings into uh, his narration. Then we had Amit Chowdhury, Odysseus Abroad. Uh, we were fascinated by, by the good prose and the kind of humorous delineation of the immigrant experience, uh, which was, of course, delineated with a kind of quiet anger against the colonizer, and, and the deep humanity that informed the entire work. And we had Anuradha Roy's Sleeping on Jupiter, uh, which had a kind of very quiet, uh, meditative, lyrical, evocative kind of style. And it also offered a kind of critique of violence, which seems to be extremely relevant to our times, and also a critique of religious hypocrisy and exploitation. And also it's conjuring up of a place where my human emotions are played out in their diverse and uh, um, contradictory uh, incarnations. Uh, we uh, had also Easter in Kire, uh, whose novel uh, when, the rivers, uh, when the River Sleeps, uh, 
uh, is um, a fine example of uh, how a kind of mythopoeic imagination can work in our times. Uh, and, uh, and here was uh, Nagaland before us, an almost unexplored continent as, long as, uh, as, far, as, the, as far as Indian fiction is concerned. And, and her concern with uh, a, a very different way of life. And in fact, not only concern, but uh, the way it offers an alternative way of, uh, way of life. And, uh, and, uh, and the way it pursues a mysterious uh, dream and its profound uh, symbolism that, uh, that um, um, explores the true meaning of what, it, what does it mean to be spiritual today. And we had Janis Parry at the Seahorse. Again, uh, he, um, here was the retelling of a myth uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, Poseidon and uh, Pelops. As, uh, it was a beautiful uh, coming of age tale. Uh, well, well, well narrated with lyrical intensity. Um, its uh, narration was quite moving, and uh, uh, it's a novel primarily also of loss and rediscovery, and of, of, of love and of healing. We had also Siddharth Choudhury, Patna Manual of Style. It has a very peculiar kind of very provincial, impish kind of humor. Uh, it is one of the one of the most readable books that uh, we we found uh, among these uh, 60 books. And it has also a deep understanding of a small town life in India, and, uh, uh, and, and it has a, a deep sense of irony and wit, the only ways in which perhaps modern life can be uh, looked at and uh, uh, narrated. Now I, will, um, I would uh, request uh, Alexander McCall Smith to announce the winner and also read out the very short citation that we have prepared for the, din for the winner. May I? I don't want to prolong the agony any further. Uh, but I would just like to say very quickly, um, on behalf of uh, the authors invited uh, fr from abroad to participate in this wonderful literary festival, I'd like to thank the Hindu newspaper and the organizers of the festival for this marvelous opportunity to exchange ideas with colleagues. Uh, the whole festival, literary festival, is a, is a wonderful, delightful cake on which we feast for a weekend, and of course the cake has the icing, and the icing is a literary prize. And so I pass on to um, my very uh, pleasant um, uh, du duty, uh, which is to announce the win winner of, of this uh, very important literary prize. And it goes to When the River Sleeps by Esther Kerr. <laughs> And here's the citation which goes with this prize. Heart stones, seers, and forest spirits comprise the world of this tender philosophical novel which is set in Nagaland and speaks to the present moment in Indian history. Only those with the greatest metal can pluck a heart stone out of a distant sleeping river, and Kiri does it. from the winner. Thank you again, Chennai. <laughs> Big thank you to the Hindu group. And I'm so honored. I'm just very happy at this moment. But I want to share this with uh, a few people that I will name here, and then, of course, with all of you. Um, Yes, I have to say a big thank you to my beautiful editor, that's Preeti Gill, 
and uh, her co-editor, Michael Hennes. Uh, my research um, associate, that was uh, Dr. Visoval. Then, big thank you to my wonderful publisher, Urvashi Butalia from Zuban. Um, yes, and then I want to say that this is not my book. Uh, we've gotten used to calling it our book because there's a lot of people who embrace it as their book. So, a very, very big thank you to all my beautiful, beautiful readers out there who would probably watch this on film later. And then I want to say a big thank you to God who gave me these stories. But I'd like to say it in the language that my uh, protagonist, Vilje, would have said. So I will say, Thank you all.